Welcome. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Media Mentors, Helping Children Build Literacy Skills for the Digital Age. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Susan Hopart, the Training and Education Manager here at TechSoup, and I'll also be your facilitator for this webinar. TechSoup is fortunate and we're excited to work with the Early Learning Lab to present this webinar, which is the second in a series of four webinars for the early, early, early learning community. We do want this presentation to be relevant to the important work you do with and for young children, so we appreciate the time that you took to answer the registration questions. Also, your opinion is very important to us as we develop the other two webinars in this series. Please do take the time to complete the survey at the end of this webinar. I want to talk a little bit about ReadyTalk, which is the platform we use to present the information. Um, on the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you should see a chat box. In this chat box, you can ask all of your burning questions, anything you would like to ask the presenters. You can also chat any problems you're having with audio or visual. Um, Becky Wiegan, our uh, webinar training manager, is on the back end and she'll be helping you with all of those questions. Um, if you lose your internet connection, you can always reconnect using the link in your registration or reminder email. Um, if you're hearing an echo, it could be that you're logged in twice. Um, most sound will come through computer speakers, but if you're having any difficulty with audio, you can also dial in using the toll-free line listed in your registration email. We are recording this presentation for later archiving on our TechSoup webinar page and the Early Learning Lab. Um, this recording should be ready for you in about a week. Um, on our webinar page at www.techsoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars, this is a location where we share all of our webinar recordings and announce upcoming events. You can also review the recorded webinar and videos on our YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com slash video. Again, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording, a presentation, PowerPoint, as well as any resources we share today. We will also try to compile a list of frequently asked questions um, that will also accompany that email. If you are following along with Twitter, you can tweet us at TechSoup or using hashtag TSWebinars. As I mentioned, we are thrilled to be partnering with the Early Learning Lab. Um, today we have Chital Singh here with us. She is the Director of Design and Innovation at the Early Learning Lab where she works to build the capacity for innovation and the use of new technologies for preschools and community-based organizations working with families of children birth through five. Her work at the Early Learning Lab builds upon 15 years of experience in digital media and technology to solve social problems. Also joining us today is Chip. Chip is the Director of Tech Center at Erickson Institute in Chicago, and he's also a Senior Fellow and member of the Advisory Board of the Fred Rogers Center for Early Learning and Children's Media at St. Vincent College. He's Editor of Technology and Digital Media in the Early Years, Tools for Teaching and Learning, and is editing a new book, Family Engagement in the Digital Age, Early Childhood Educators as Media Mentors. In 2012, he received the BAMI Award and Educator's Voice Award as Innovator of the Year from the Academy of Education, Arts, and Sciences. We also have joining us Lisa Guernsey. She's the Director of Early Education Initiatives and the Learning Technologies Project in the Education Policy Program at New America. She leads teams of writers and analysts to tell stories, examine policies, and generate ideas for new approaches to helping disadvantaged students succeed. We also have Michael. Michael is the founding executive director of the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop. And the center conducts research, builds multi-sector alliances, and catalyzes industry and policy reforms needed to advance high quality media experiences for vulnerable children. 
today we are going to be talking about the term Media Mentor. We will explain the importance of Media Mentors. We will also identify and discuss the skills that Media Mentors need, and answer your questions you might have about this term and how it applies to your work. Before I turn it over to Chatel, I am going to talk to you a little bit about TechSoup. Um, TechSoup is headquartered here in San Francisco, California. And we'd like to know where you're joining us from. Why don't we go ahead and try out the chat box if everyone can chat in the city and state or country that you're joining us from. And while you do that, I'll talk to you a little bit more about TechSoup. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit like many of you. We work to empower organizations around the world to get the latest tools, skills, and resources to help them achieve their mission. You can see from our map that we serve almost every country in the world. We do have a global website. So um, if you are joining us from another country, you can actually choose the country where you are joining from, and you can access the website where there are product donations that are available to eligible nonprofits and libraries. Our impact. We have helped organizations get more than $5.2 billion in technology products and grants to NGOs around the world. And these tech uh, products and grants come from more than 100 corporate and foundation partners. So uh, we are going to turn this over to Chital from the Early Learning Lab. And again, it's our privilege to be here today. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you enjoy this program. Chital. Thank you, Susan. I love that question about where people are coming from. It's so exciting to see um, that we have people from Australia, from New Mexico, from I don't know, um, <laughs> just all over the country and other countries. So welcome, everyone. Um, as Susan said, I'm with the Early Learning Lab, and we are based in Oakland, California. And we are very pleased to be working with TechSoup and other partners to bring you this webinar series on Early Learning and Technology. This is number two in our series of four webinars that we are producing for the field. And um, absolutely thrilled to bring um, Chip and Michael and Lisa into this discussion and um, really learn about media mentorship and how, how we could support early literacy. So very briefly about the Early Learning Lab. As I said, we are based in Oakland. We're a young organization that's working to support the early childhood education field at large. We are doing this through the creation of aligned learning and innovation networks, which really means that what we do is we bring different stakeholders together in a co-creation process to solve problems in the early childhood education field. So we work with school districts, we work with community-based organizations that are serving families, and we work with a range of organizations specifically around how technology can further the work that we're doing to support young children. But when it comes to technology, we're really looking at three different levels. We're looking at the supply of tech products that are out there to support our work. We work with technologists to ensure that products are research-based and that they really meet the needs of the fields, and that the people who are working in the field are informing the design of technology. And we also work to help program implementers and families understand what's available and help them make smart decisions about what to use. And finally, we're huge perform proponents of research to practice. So this is what this webinar series is, is trying to get at. But bringing the latest in research in early learning and child development to people who are working with children and families on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that we all have a shared understanding and that we're using the research and science to, def to inform the way that we work with families and children. As, as part of the technology work that we're doing, again, the webinar trainings are a big part of it, but we're also trying to identify what we call those high value design elements that are successful in the way that technology is used. We're also um, curating events and working to incubate new and improved technology solutions for the field. So that is just a brief overview of our organization. You can find out more by going to our website, which is earlylearninglab.org. And with that, we're going to begin our show. And I'm going to 
hand over the controls to Lisa. Great. Wonderful. Th thanks so much, Chital. And um, I know um, I speak on behalf of, of Chip and Michael, but just, just saying thanks. We're really happy to be part of this, um, to be supporting the Early Learning Lab, and to be part of TechSoup's fantastic network. Uh, it's really, again, ex it is exciting to see so many people who are um, in the webinar with us right now. And we do want to make this an interactive um, experience for, for so many of you because I think that there are a lot, of, a lot of other experts out there. We certainly are not um, by any stretch the only ones. What we're going to do today is um, take you through some slides to kind of set up the, the concept of, of media um, mentors and mentorship, um, provide some context. Um, and we also are going to be basing a lot of our, our, our conversation on two books that um, are one that is out and another that is on its way uh, to being published. Michael Levine and I are the authors of Tap, Click, Read, Growing Readers in a World of Screens, which was released last fall and the enhanced ebook versions came out about a month ago. And Chip Donahue has edited uh, a, a new volume um, that's in, in many ways kind of a companion to the other uh, technology book that was referenced earlier in this one, um, Stanley Engagement in the Digital Age, uh, and will be coming this fall. I'm sure Chip will tell you a little bit more about that. We do really want to um, hear from all of you, so certainly in the, in the questions on this webinar, but in general, there are lots of ways through Twitter to stay connected, I think, in, in this field across early education, across the library world, across the, the public school system, across community engagement programs. Um, so we hope you will, will follow along with us and join in the conversation. So we want to start by understanding um, our audience a little bit more and uh, want to start with this poll. So if you could take a moment to answer this question, um, which of these words describes you? That would be tremendous to us. It will give us a sense of, of who we have with us. And, um, and I can see already that many responses are coming in, and we're getting a good sense of, of who's there. I'll uh, let this go a little bit longer so we make sure that we are capturing everybody. It, it does appear that we have a lot of librarians. We'll see this in the results in one moment here, um, as well as a lot of folks who put themselves in, in different categories. Uh, Several, several people who are in the research world as well. Um, so I think I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm going to skip to the results now. We can see what that what that's starting to look like. It's um, it's really exciting actually to be on this. I'm, I'm thrilled to see this actually that there are a lot of librarians um, who are are going to be part of this. And again, we really are going to be eager to interact with you and hear your ideas. Um, so g given that, I'm going to go ahead now to the the next slide as well, and, and realizing as well, Michael and Chip, you probably feel the same way. That other category is very intriguing to me, and maybe in our question and answers we can learn a little bit more about how different people are um, labeling themselves, where, where they would see themselves in this field. So the next question for all of us is um, whether you've ever heard of this concept of media mentors or media mentorship before coming to this webinar. And this will just give us um, a sense as well of um, whether we are starting, starting new and fresh, or whether this is something that many of you have already encountered. I'm sure there are lots of questions, because there's lots of questions even in my mind <laughs> about what, um, what, what the field needs to do to help define this term. But I'm seeing those responses come in now as well. And um, I'm going to skip to the results here too, so you all can see what, what's arriving. It looks like about 45 to 46% of you haven't heard the term before, um, which is totally understandable given that it's quite new. Um, and it looks like we've got about 20, 23% who identify, 23.5% who, who identify as a media mentor. So um, this is, this is going to be really helpful for us as we move forward. All right, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about why there um, from, from our, our points of view, we've been sensing a need for uh, media mentorship. What problems are we really trying to solve? So there are a couple of statistics I uh, wanted to kind of put in front of us here. One is that we've seen from surveys that early 
educators, those who um, would define themselves as preschool teachers, K3 teachers, um, those who are caregivers um, in the birth through the third grade space, that they um, are, are feeling a need for more support and guidance. There was a poll from NAEYC, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, um, done with Northwestern and the Fred Rogers Center a couple of years ago that showed that more than one-third of respondents uh, had said that they did not receive enough technical support, and the majority of respondents said that they had not, um, you know, more than about 57 percent, um, said they were receiving professional development and technology only once a year or, or uh, even, even less than that. So we certainly see um, that there's a hunger out there um, and there's a need to be filled. Another statistic that's important is to recognize that a lot of uh, families, parents are looking around trying to find some guidance on these issues. When is media useful um, to their children? Uh, when is it not? There are a, a, a majority of parents who really see media as an educational, uh, particularly as they define it, educational media as a positive force in their children's lives. Um, and that's from a learning at home survey that the Cooney Center um, put out a, a over two years ago now. And then we also have statistics, I'm going to move us to this next slide, that show that children themselves are, um, maybe they're not necessarily answering questions about how media fits in their life, but they are, um, they are of course, being uh, tested on a variety of different literacy measures. And from what we see in the national statistics on children's ability to understand what they read and um, comprehend at a proficient level what they read. We're seeing that more than two-thirds of fourth graders are unable to heat, hit that mark of proficiency, that they're struggling with the materials that are put in front of them. We've called this in the Tap Click Read Book the quiet crisis. Given that, we are also seeing, um, and, and I think we all recognize that there's a need to put these these issues in, in context, not just in schools, not just in libraries, but across various uh, settings from birth up through elementary school. And um, there's a report that New America put out last fall that I'm showing you here on the screen from crawling to walking, which is a looking at states and state policies in the birth through third grade realm, looking at a whole host of different policies that relate to language development and literacy in particular, and shows that many states are really struggling. As we, as we put it, they're toddling uh, to, to kind of get up to speed. Some are crawling, uh, few are walking, no state is running. There are a lot of policies that we have to um, certainly in, in New America's mind, uh, that really need to be fixed and improved upon. But within that context, we're also recognizing that children need those, those family engagement supports. They also need educators around them. And this includes librarians and, um, and parents to start to, to understand. I really do think library, librarians especially quite absolutely get this, but to understand that literacy is not just about decoding words on a page, uh, that learning to read requires a two-pronged approach. And learning to be a, a literate human being really requires this approach. And it's uh, an approach that helps children develop their skills, and that certainly does include decoding, but a lot of other um, skills around oral language, and also gives them a knowledge base, helps to develop their background knowledge so they can understand the world around them. We've also noticed, just some more context here, that there is um, a huge explosion of educational apps out there that we're all trying to kind of understand better. We put the words educational in quotes in this particular slide uh, because we are recognizing that there are a lot of questions about what is really educational and what isn't, and, um, and Michael will go into that a little bit more later in our remarks. The field of early education, though, has really been responding to this. A uh, question for parents in many ways. Um, over the past several years, we have had things like the release of Take a Giant Step, which is a paper on teacher preparation that the Cooney Center was highly involved in. The National Association for the Education of Young Children and the Fred Rogers Center have put out a position statement 
on technology in early childhood uh, and in early education settings. And this, this other piece that you see in front of you here with the blue bar uh, titled Using Screen Media with Young Children is part of a suite of documents that the organization Zero to Three has put out. Um, under the, they have a whole suite of materials called Screen Sense that are research-based pieces of guidance for those who work with very young children. And lastly, we are recognizing, or almost like, not quite last, but almost lastly, we're recognizing that it's not just um, that people have concerns about the amount of time. Um, we can certainly talk about the amount of time that uh, children might be using media, but they're also wondering about how it's used and who's with children when they're using it. I often, and, and many other colleagues often talk about the three C's, which are the importance of the content, the importance of the context, and the importance of the individual child in recognizing how today's kids learn from the media around them. And uh, well-designed content and the importance of context, somebody with children helping them to learn and understand, those are critical components and feed into this media mentorship concept. And, and lastly, this is the one piece I wanted to reference for those who may not know about this. The American Academy of Pediatrics has signaled that they are planning to revise their guidelines on how screen media is used with young children. And so on screen here you see just a, 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 a snapshot of a really fantastic report that they published in October of last year. Um, and there's a lot more to come from the AAP on this. But in short, they are focused on content and context as well. So now I will shift us to another poll. And um, hopefully we can get a good sense of how we're all feeling, uh, given that context, how we're feeling about some of these issues. So if you can answer this one, how are you feeling about the capabilities of today's professionals to assist families as they navigate the digital age? It would be great to um, get your, your take on this. We have everything from very optimistic to very pessimistic here. And I think as I skip to the results, we'll see them come across the screen as you are, are filling in your polls. Um, and that's, yeah, this is really great to see. It's super interesting because I also think, I think about myself and how I would answer a poll like this. And sometimes it depends on the day, right, <laughs> what you've actually encountered uh, in your library or with your, with the children that you're working with. But right now we have about um, 47 to 48% of folks saying that they're, they're cautiously optimistic. So this is a group that um, seems to understand that there, there may be some promise out there, but uh, perhaps we have to be really mindful about what's ahead. So I'll move it now to our, our next slide, and I'm going to turn it over to Michael Levine. I'll be still controlling it, so Michael, feel free to tell me when you need me to move. But Michael is going to go, go ahead and um, provide a little bit more information from our book. Thanks so much, Lisa. And hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be with you. And so great to see um, friends and colleagues and folks from across the globe joining us. So um, the movement in the field, which um, we just saw reflected I think in the poll and also in Lisa's remarks is, is very encouraging um, because our research leads us to one simple conclusion, which I think many of you may have come to as well. You just have to take a modern approach. Um, and that includes activating media savvy mentors who are informed by the best research and practices. We've been trying to do our part, as Lisa mentioned, for the past several years, we've been sifting through research on digital media, taking a really close look at the app stores, and learning from initiatives across the country, many of you are leaders in those initiatives, to help create a vision of what this modern approach might look like. And as we're starting to find some really interesting exemplars, we realize that it often becomes a little bit easier to show than to tell. So um, on the tapclickread.org website, you can get access to the interactive um, features of the book, the videos that we've created. And uh, we wanted to be able to show you, um, Susan, we want to be able to show one video now on a great program for migrant families in rural Maine. So let's take a look if this will work. Great. Bear with me, with me one moment while I queue it up. Thank you.
is a rural main town of about 1,200 people, and there are about 250 Hispanic families in this area, mostly because uh, they came here as migrant workers originally to work and harvest blueberries in the month of August. As families started to settle in this area, the school system has tried to be responsive, but a lot of times they're not aware of what issues non-English speaking families are facing. Comienza en Casa, It Starts at Home is a program that we started in the spring of 2012. And the goal of the program is to provide parents with the tools and information that they need to help their child prepare for kindergarten. De los apps, cuando hacer, uh... We help parents load an iPad with different educational apps. And what we do is we create units that focus on just a couple of early learning concepts. And then the parents will take home the iPad and be able to explore those concepts in, in different ways. Yes. What color is it? We have to have pizza. How many, what color are you choosing? Orange. One, orange, yeah. Six orange. Six oranges, yeah. Jaden wasn't really, he didn't really want to read or write or like do a lot of like, I didn't really know what to teach him. So, <laughs> and the idea is that like the videos and the apps and it gives you like a lot of ideas like to get you thinking of what he needs to learn to, to get ready for kindergarten. What color are you looking for? Blue. Blue. Where's the blue dot? You see it? Huh? You found it. It's a wonderful tool using iPads with students that are English language learners. Um, for example, it's, it's very visual. It's very exciting. They really are um, enjoying hearing those digital stories with the music, with the sound. Uh, I, I don't know how it's happening, but they're more engaged. I see more engagement. Let's find something red. What is it? Can you take it? Yeah. We definitely emphasize doing off-screen activities as well. So they're taking pictures with it. They're recording videos. Um, yes, there are apps that, that are for playing, but they also connect to things that they're doing every day that, you know, there's definitely a balance of education being part of everyday life, which isn't always uh, on a screen, hopefully. <laughs> a lot of the migrant families that we work with have been really disempowered by the different systems that they have to engage with. The program itself has helped me get more, be more confident as a parent to know what to teach him, how to prepare him in school, and know what he needs to learn. This is my pink book. This is a rainbow pillow. Teaching is scary. And just having that iPad and having those apps that relate to a concept that you want to teach, it does help a parent. It shows them where to go. And it's just taking that first step using that iPad for that journey of um, exploration and education with their child. We focus on, on working with parents because they're the ones who are going to be there throughout their child's educational experience. As a teacher, I can tell pretty quickly in my kindergarten classroom um, the students that have parents that are actively engaged. Those children that come to school, they want to learn. They're on fire. Those are the types of things that you see when you do have that strong parent engagement.
So sorry about some of the technical difficulties that some of you may have experienced. If you want to see it, um, you, of course, can go to YouTube. But you can also go to tapquickread.org. And you note that there are um, really important mentoring adults who are featured um, in each of the videos, teachers, parents, librarians, community activists, home visitors, and so on. So um, thanks. Next one. So you know, I hope that that gave you a sense of at least how one community is taking a different approach to how technology can be used. Um, I've been very influenced. This chart shows you it's not my dissertation. <laughs> it's a chart that actually takes into account the work of my mentor, Yuri Brown from Denner, and what he called ecological systems theory. I won't get into all the details, but basically children's learning and development depends on, as most of you know from your work, a predictable but complex web of human relationships that begin in infancy. Um, Yuri Brown from Denner described this family as a microsystem, a place where a wonderful ping pong match or today's languages serve and return is going on between a highly responsive caring adult and a child who he or she is hopefully crazy about. So over time, of course, a child moves out of the home to establish important relationships with a web of adults and peers in different settings, such as schools, libraries, and neighborhood centers. So in short, the theory asserts, and this is not a political statement, but it does take a village to help a child get a good start. So an important element of our research here at the Keeney Center focuses on the potential of what um, experts, uh, and we've been calling joint media engagement, or how are families and children learning together, experiencing media together. Um, one interesting you know, area which I think is ripe for more research is how children might learn content knowledge. That knowledge piece we described as one of the two prongs that Lisa um, introduced a bit earlier by watching media together with their parents or siblings or interacting in new ways with rich content that sparks their curiosity. How can we reinvent the family hour to help kids want to learn more about a topic, something they're passionate about? Next one. So we see the potential in using technology, but you know, in service of learning as an assist to what's going on inside the classroom or inside um, the learning within the library, the learning environment. If we're going to create an ecosystem of learning around children, we can't rely on the marketplace alone. Um, here are a few facts from the recent analysis we described in Tap Click Read. One concern we've had all along is that this booming apps marketplace, which Lisa described, is not doing nearly enough to support community programs and their educational mission. So our team's been really digging into what's in the app stores in terms of early, early literacy learning. What we found is definitely cause for concern. Um, this report, which was released about five or six months ago, goes into great detail about what we found. It's called Getting a Read on the App Stores. So here's a bit about the analysis of that report, and we have ongoing analyses uh, underway as well, which we can talk about in the Q&A. First, we wanted to know who the developers are who are creating literacy apps, uh, who, who they're, they're creating literacy apps for, pardon me. No surprise here, the most commonly mentioned audience were kids in the preschool 3 to 5 age range, followed by kids in elementary school and babies and toddlers. I should say that these categories are not mutually exclusive. A single app may have mentioned 0 to 2 and 3 to 5. Um, a really important goal of our scan was to document and determine which language and literacy skills were being targeted by developers. Um, we consulted curriculum experts and research on literacy development and came up with nearly two dozen different skills to look for. This chart displays the eight that were mentioned by at least 10 different apps in our analysis. We're seeing an abundance of fairly basic skills, which won't surprise you. This corresponds to the predominant focus on the preschool age, you know, audience, the skills, and the phonics that they need to master. But we did know that reading comprehension which is typically considered a higher order skill, is now on the list. And this is actually movement from the last time that we did study. And that vocabulary development is beginning to get some very well-deserved attention from developers of um, popular apps. It's a very positive sign. 
here's a finding that surprised us, and sorry that that slide somehow doesn't array that well in this particular format. But when we were first coming up with our sampling, we were interested in whether the apps that won accolades from the expert review sites would tend to be the same apps that show up in the most popular list. It turns out the answer is really no, mostly no. In fact, um, over 8 in 10, maybe 3 percent of the apps that were included in our sample because they won awards um, from expert review sites were not among the top 50 lists for paid and free apps. Next one. Almost none of the apps in our sample were designed for that co-play, for that joint media engagement um, experience, meaning mom and dad playing with their child together or even sharing information with adults after the fact. Remember though that ArtScan was um, actually over a year and year and a half ago now, and things may be changing on this front. Um, anecdotally, I can say, and I think Lisa would agree, that we've been pitched by many more companies with apps that have a co-play or a co-use centerpiece. I mean, I especially like the work of um, a really wonderful app by the name of Toontastic. And just in the last couple of months, we've gotten wind of a really lovely new one called HangArt, an app that's like Hangman but uses even more graphical options for kids to play with together. Next one. So that's just a taste of our findings from the apps analysis. Um, let's turn to what we know about ebooks and their effectiveness. And this is something that many of the librarians who are on the call today are very, very well aware of the transitions that are underway from print to digital within library systems. There's a ton to learn here. One study that we uh, detail in the book showed that very young children could get something out of interactive content on a touch screen if the place that a child was touching, if the invitation to click or tap was associated with a specific word that child was being taught. But just indiscriminate tapping does nothing for them. Our own research here at the Community Center also shows that some of the hot spots that exist within enhanced books are a distraction from early literacy learning. We know from many studies that adult-child interaction still really matters and plays an important role in helping children learn. Um, some key learning moments occur in the questions and answers that really important ping pong match, the conversation that happens between adults and children about the content of the book that they're reading together. And of course, the design of a book can trigger those great individual con conversations or it can cut them off. Some of the most interesting studies that we detail in Tap Quick Read are ones that show the significance of both good design and the power, of course, of that parent or that caregiver being fully engaged. Um, in the most recent issue of Young Children, which is a publication of uh, NACI, we write about the latest science on ebooks and how they affect interaction. One really interesting study in Israel showed that the most optimal situation is a well-designed ebook coupled with an interactive reading partner sitting with the child. In that study, what I mentioned before, a well-designed ebook led the adult reader to ask deeper questions um, um, than the adults who use the printed book, which then led to richer interactions, of course, with the child. So I guess I would say in sum, the mounting research on the importance of interactions, not a shock to most of you who work with parents and children every day, um, is you know, really, really important in, in anything that we think about vis-a-vis -vis technology. We need to think about technology not so much as a productivity driver or as an engagement driver, although those are all possibilities, as we need to think about them as a relationship driver. Um, so in real programs that are powered by real relationships in Head Start centers, elementary school classrooms, home visiting programs, libraries, and others, we just need to take a look at relationships being at the center. In fact, um, many of these relationship-oriented, tech-assist, more robust you know, educational content built into them programs are underway around the country. You see here on this map um, an interactive um, um, feature of our, of, of our integrating technology in early literacy platform is that you can take a look at some almost three dozen programs that we've plotted on this map. And Later this summer, and those of you who are interested in knowing more about this, we can talk about it offline. 
we're pulling together an institute to help connect leaders in many communities with researchers, policymakers, and innovators to make sure that everyone learns from each other about what's working well and what is not. So um, let's take your pulse a little bit with this quick poll. Are you part of a project or initiative that involves training, program, training parents or educators about the best use of media and technology with young children? Oh, cool. We're seeing the primacy of the library professionals who are here today, which is great. And if folks are not finding these categories satisfactory, just um, put a, a note in the chat window. Maybe some folks are from industry or from research doing interesting um, experimentation or design in this area. Very interesting. So about a third of those being polled are, are not involved, and um, it looks like just about half are involved in a public library, nonprofit, or public school, and about one in seven are you know, elsewhere. So um, this is a good segue to introduce um, Chip to talk a bit about um, what we have foreshadowed, the importance of some of these relationship drivers what we're calling media mentors, Chip Donahue. And, and this is Lisa. Yeah, Chip, you got it. So we, it's, we're happy to take a pause too to oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there was one comment more. Slide that I can introduce. I mean, we, we've been tracking, and AL, you know, the, many of you on the phone, the Association of Library Services to Children been looking directly at public libraries and their approach. Um, if you want to show the white paper? Yes, sure. I'll go ahead and, and show the yeah. video you may So, so this that. white paper, which was published, what, about um, a little bit over a year and a quarter ago, has a real interesting call to action for children's and youth librarians, and it was you know, adopted by the ALCS. Uh, the AL, ALSC's executive board, and it I think stimulated a lot of the activity in getting libraries and librarians to equip their staff to, you know, model what it means to be um, a media mentor and defining um, the art form such as it is. And, and now I think I will turn it over to Chip. Maybe I'll just jump in with one quick comment on that, Michael, before um, yeah. Chip gets yeah, on too. We can talk about that, um, that various uh, librarians who are in uh, are in this webinar with us might might know about. There are, are several uh, librarian leaders: Ken Campbell, Claudia Haynes, uh, Dorothy Stoltz. Um, many of the people who were part of the writing of this particular piece, um, Amy Costner, who are really working hard to think more deeply about what media mentorship means within children's library services in particular. And um, there, is a, there will be a new book coming out in addition to the one that Chip's editing that um, Ken Campbell and Claudia Haynes have been working on uh, that also relates to some of the, the issues of media mentorship very particular to libraries. So I just wanted to to give a shout out to that. I'm really excited about that book coming as well. And there will be a lot of, I think, opportunity for richer discussion once we have those materials too. And Lisa and Michael, is this a good time to take a couple of questions? Yeah, sure. It sounds like if we've got a little bit of time, it might be a nice moment to pause a, a bit and, and hear what people are asking. Yeah, um, we did have a question about how to evaluate apps. Is there some objective form or rubric or um, tool that folks can access and use for that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll take that and then you know, Lisa may want to offer comments on, on it as well. Um, in the book we do list, and you can get this without the book on the website, tap click read, a number of different research informed resources that are doing apps analysis and apps rating. For example, there's a great site that Common Sense Media runs for educators which is called Graphite, 
there's very, very strong work being done by Warren Buckleitner and his colleagues at the Children's Technology Review. And I'm also a fan of the site uh, Teachers with Apps. But there are other really good rating organizations. Um, Batfire Web is another one that you can find. And we'll send you the link. Media for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I was going um, just to, just to piggyback on that in a little bit. Later in this, we'll show you a, a screenshot of where you can find some lists that we've put together for uh, various um, educators, family engagement specialists, those who want to get a better handle on who the app reviewers are and what criteria they're using when they're determining what apps should be in their suite of resources. So you can find that at tapquickread.org slash take action. Um, I'll show you that in a little bit here. There's also, um, I think this broader question, it, it begs upon a broader question that I think many, many people are trying to kind of grapple with, which is that there's the need for curation and better understanding of the materials that are out there, um, because it's certainly not just, not just books anymore, and not even really just kind of DVDs and whether to put DVDs on a shelf. There's a really big questions out there about to what extent um, you help parents find other kinds of digital materials to use with their children. So that's about materials, but one of the things we're, we're seeing as we look around the country at what's really working, we're seeing that it helps to have the materials coupled with really deep relationship building programs. And that's why we yeah. um, described that earlier and showed and plotted on the map. There are a lot of places, whether they're embedded in library programs or in Head Start or in home visiting programs where they're, they're not just relying on the materials. They're recognizing that they have a role to play in modeling, whether it's through story times, um, uh, modeling um, based on even just the questions asked and the way we talk about the way media is used with children. Um, and, and that's just really a nascent new area that is part of this media mentorship idea. And one more comment from me. So if, if there are academics or folks who are really interested in um, strategies that scholars are using to understand how literacy-oriented um, apps or, or books are being developed. Um, the work of Kathy Hirsch-Pasek and her colleague Roberta Gollenkopf that they set Temple University and University of Delaware, respectively, is very, very interesting and important to understand. They are very interested in rating the apps around literacy development. And then Barbara Kowata at um, University of Utah Utah State, Lisa, or University of Utah, um, is also doing very, very interesting. Yeah, work. actually, I think she might be with Brigham Young. Brigham Young University. Yeah. So sorry. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, doing very, very important work in this area as well. Great, and we can probably include um, those references and resources in the follow-up email that we'll send out in a couple of days. Um, Great. Yeah, um, there was another. Uh, question. Actually, it was a comment from Amanda that it would be nice to have like a, a resource room or a joint place where all of the, the, the professionals on this webinar and elsewhere could share good and bad finds that they experience in their workplace. Mm. Perhaps. That's a, that's a really great idea. I mean, we, we certainly are seeing the need. People want to network. They want to share stories, they, whether they're horror stories or exciting stories, right, of, about what's working and what's not. And, um, and one of the reasons we're, we're doing this Summer Institute that Michael mentioned, that again, we're, we're happy to follow up with you on, is that we see a need for people to kind of um, to, to get together and hear stories about how they're trying to use media in, in new ways. But this is across everything from you know, community organizations and mayor's offices to um, school districts to, of, of course, libraries as well. Is there a place right now where people do this? That's a really good question. Maybe others who are on this webinar can point to forums or associations that are, um, have uh, moments, special in interest group sessions where this kind of conversation can flourish. We do have a few coming into the chat that we can re-chat out to everyone. Um, it looks like a couple of people. Uh, Storytimeunderground.org. Um, That's a big one, Jessica. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. um, another uh, comment or suggestion uh, from Laurie is, um, 
Are there ways to get for-profit companies like Apple to highlight apps that are rated by those particular agencies that you've discussed as highly yeah. effective? So kind of an advocacy from the for-profit industry. Yeah, I'll take that for a second. It's a great question that we get asked all the time. Um, we do have folks who we have been working with at Apple to do, as well as at Google and other you know, platforms that are trying to array you know, more research-informed um, you know, apps and you know, books for, for kids within their existing platforms. But we have to remember that these are organizations that are thinking about profit first and impact second often. Um, we're very interested in working here at the Community Center with other groups whose mission is directly to share the good stuff. And so there is an experimental project right now underway. I don't know how many of the folks who are logged in here know about First Book, but Lisa will talk a little bit about First Book a bit later. We're looking to partner with this platform that has over 275,000 members who are reaching several million low-income families and children around the United States to um, share the research, but also possibly to be able to make a distribution effort to get the good stuff in flowing in the direction of the families who need that the most. Great. Those were the questions we had in the queue right now, Michael and Lisa. So I think perhaps we are ready for Chip. That's great. And there's lots and lots of really good resources being shared from NAMI, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. iLab, from ALSC, <laughs> and it's really, really good to have this interaction with the community that have generously um, lent their time here today. So Chip, take it away. Chip, um, you may um, – we're having a little bit of difficulty. Could Chip be on mute? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Sorry. Not sure what happened there. You know, it's, it, we shouldn't expect that people who work in technology have any idea how to do it. <laughs> so, that's just good. so thank you, Michael and Lisa, for, for um, getting us to this point, and thank you for inviting me to jump in at this point to talk about uh, the new book, which, which Michael and Lisa contributed to, Family Engagement in the Digital Age, Early Childhood Educators as Media Mentors. And, and it's really the intersection of those two ideas that I think makes the book unique. When we started, and one of the joys of being an editor of a volume like this is you get to invite thought leaders and friends to, to contribute. Uh, but when I did that, um, I talked about family engagement in the digital age and what do we know, what's working, what's innovative, how are we using technology to connect more effectively with families. But then I tagged on this notion of media mentors and, and everybody just kind of struggled a little bit with well, what does that really mean and how is it relevant to the work I'm doing. Um, I got to tell you that what people came back with is so inspiring and so exciting. Uh, and as we've said already, this idea actually began with with Lisa writing this phrase in, a, in an interview or an article and the library world took it and ran. Um, we're not wanting to take it and run. We're wanting to actually uh, enrich it or expand it a little bit and think about who else are media mentors and how do we prepare them in the same ways that we've been reflecting on librarians. So that's, that's the intent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the frame of family engagement in the digital age to, uh, to make that case and, and to point you to some, some ways in which technology uh, is in fact helping families to connect differently uh, and in more quality ways. I love this quote from Fred Rogers, strengthen a parent and you strengthen a child. To me that's the rationale for parent involvement and communication and engagement, right? We work with the parents so that we can in fact improve uh, outcomes for children. Um, and, and you know the modern version of family engagement we're wanting to improve family well-being and, and everybody in the conversation uh, to, to get stronger. But that notion of, of um, strengthening a parent, I think, is, is, is really embedded in my own philosophy. Uh, we talk about parent empowerment. We talk about engaging families. Uh, it's not about telling families what to do or telling parents 
how to use media or, or even which often happens in the media right now telling parents they're not being great parents because of the way they're using media. It's around tapping into what they know about their own children and, and what they care deeply about about their family and then connecting them to thoughts about how to use media well. So, so that I, I want you to have that frame as I go on. It's really about empowerment and, um, and that family engagement is a two-way reciprocal relationship. This is not something we do to families. This is something we do with families. And then Ellen Golinski and others have created the, uh, this environment called Room, and uh, I love the very first words that a parent who signs up hears. You already have what it takes. What wonderful affirmation. What wonderful encouragement. What wonderful gentle nudges, right? So if you already have what it takes, what we're doing is honoring what you know right now, and we're going to build from there. What a different message than, well, you have no idea what you're doing, and we're going to tell you how it works. Um, I think that's just so empowering. And I think all of us have been, Michael, at least I've all been at presentations where Ellen's shown some video around people seeing that message for the first time, and it is really moving and really powerful. So, you know, you got it. You, you know what I'm trying to say here. Uh, this is about uh, how we really can connect with families in new ways. So the idea uh, is can we intentionally use technology to reach some of what have always been the goals of family engagement? Can we improve communication between parents and teachers? Can we strengthen that homeschool communication and, and make that more of a two-way relationship? Not, what, not just what we push to, to home, but what comes back from home. Can, in fact, uh, knowing more about what's going on in the home really help educators to enhance what they do? Can we start to build community in our schools, in our programs, in our libraries, in our children's museums where we gather families and, and young children? Can, can we really create that sense of community and connect with the communities in which we're in? Um, I'm going I'm to just pause for this moment and say, those of us who contributed to this book actually think the answer to all of these things is a resounding yes. But we've got to pay attention to how we get there, and that's part of what we were looking for and part of what what um, Michael and Lisa found in their intel work, and there's certainly overlap between the early literacy uh, best practices and innovations that they were finding and, and some of what came back around, uh, around family engagement. We want to encourage parent-to-parent -parent sharing. Somebody asked earlier, is there a way we could all as educators share what we like and don't like with each other? Absolutely. We need to do that. We need to be connected learners, and we need to create that community. But how powerful is it for parents to have the opportunity to share with other parents what they like and don't like and what's working and isn't working, and to become a media mentor for other parents because they have an idea about how to use an app or how to use uh, um, one, one of the things that's on their phone or their iPad in, in new ways. Can we increase parent and caregiver involvement? And you know, the, we're, we're coming up to the, the gold standard here, right? What we really want to know is how do we get parents or caregivers more involved, more meaningfully involved, more involved over the long term, more involved because they want to be involved and engaged, not because we say to them this is a, a critical thing. Can we enhance family engagement? Can we empower parents and families? Well, I've already told you, we, we, we absolutely believe those last two are, are what this is all about. While we are um, wildly enthusiastic about technology when it works well, the three of us on this call and, and other folks in this space, we're, we're child development people. We're not technologists. We care deeply about the healthy development of young children and, and the uh, well-being of families. What, what we're curious about is can these new devices that are in people's hands, um, smartphones and other things, can they in fact be tools to do better what we've always been trying to do? Um, and, and we're starting to get some evidence that the answer can be yes. When we think about family engagement and we think about technology, there are some things we have to be mindful of. We have to be aware of, of barriers to access. And, and Michael and, and Lisa, uh, and, and I hope my own work as well, we, we've been saying all along, if, if these devices turn out to be beneficial and lead to better outcomes for children, then they have to lead to better outcomes for all children, not just some children, not just children and families who can afford the device. We've got to really think about equity and access here. Um, I, I think it's an interesting irony that at a time when, when we have new tools that can help us address equity and access in new ways, they might in fact make it worse. They might in fact you know, widen the gap if we're not careful. So be very mindful 
of that um, and think about that. We need to meet the parents where they are, and where they are today is different than where they are five years ago. Where they are today might be on Twitter. Where they are today might be on Facebook. Where they are today might be um, that they really like to chat and get messages that way. We need to figure out what, what, what compels them, what excites them, and what ways do they like to get information and, and share information. As we do with young children, we need to think about multiple pathways, right? So we can't have one solution. And one of the things I, I worry the most about is that we get wildly excited about technology and then forget that the, the message in the lunchbox actually has worked pretty well for a long time, or the, the, the message on the bulletin board right by the door as parents come uh, has actually been effective. Um, and for some families, maybe the only way they can access it, that information. So we really need to, to think about that. This next one I think is really um, uh, fun to think about. There's some work being done around behavioral nudges, and it, it of course, intersects directly with uh, projects that are using text messages to, to send an idea or ask your child this question or here's something you can do. Uh, that, that notion of providing a nudge at the right time, just at the right time, uh, when, a, when a parent is curious about something or needs support or needs a resource, this is a powerful idea. And, and there's a wonderful chapter in the book uh, by our colleagues from the Rand Institute about um, how this big idea about behavioral nudges fits so nicely into the way we think about relationship-based interactions with families. And, and, um, and so nudges can be empowering or nudges can convince you that you don't know what you're doing. Uh, I think you already know which side of that we all come out on. Michael and, and Lisa uh, talk in the final chapter of the book about finding new allies. And, and I think that's such an important uh, part of this story. And I'm going to list some of those new allies from my perspective in a minute, but I want to circle back to what I said earlier. Media Mentors is really an idea that's grown up out of the, the library world. One of the great joys of my work over the last three or four years has been the sudden intersection of children's librarians and children's museum staff and early childhood educators around this question of digital media and how do we use it well. Um, so I, I think this does open up opportunities for, for new allies and for for finding new people to bring into the conversation and to learn with and from uh, new folks with different perspectives. And you know, I always think about, well, why weren't we always talking to librarians? Because this is sure a great conversation, and we've got a lot to learn from each other. So I'm not going to beat us up for what we haven't been doing. I'm going to really celebrate the, the moment that we have where librarians and educators and others in formal and in informal settings are, in fact, seeking each other out are looking for ways to learn from each other, are in fact becoming media mentors for each other at a professional level. And, and the goal here is that we want to be media mentors to parents so they can be media mentors to their children. Think back to the video that, that Michael showed about Comienza and Casa and all the mentoring that was going on, the mentoring that was going on to the parent so that the parent could then mentor to the child. That, that, that's it. That's what we're really talking about. And ultimately, Parents who can make these choices and feel confident and competent about doing so um, are, are you know, moving toward that level of empowerment uh, that, that we're all very excited about. So, so what works? Can we push and pull? Um, and, and I think I, I mentioned earlier that the family engagement has got to be a two-way street. It's not just what we push at parents. It's got to be what we get back from them as well and that we act on what we get back from them. And you know, I'm, I'm watching with one eye the, the back channel you know, flowing along down the left-hand side of the screen. And you know what, folks? That's it. There we go. That's it. That's connected learning. That's what we're talking about. Talk to each other. Share ideas. Throw a, a link up there. Say to somebody, here's what works for me. Or here's what doesn't. This is, this is really powerful. This is a digital age way for us to enhance our, our teaching and our, our learning and our parenting. And that, that's what we're excited about. So we've seen some examples of um, email campaigns and social media use that are, that are starting to work. Uh, lots of activity in, in the work Michael and Lisa surfaced around using text messages to, to promote early literacy or other aspects of child development. Uh, Reddy Rosie out of Texas is doing this amazing project where they send links to, to really authentic um, short video clips of parents parenting well and teachers teaching well um, to, to, um, to parents um, regularly so they can take a look and see what it looks like to do it well. I talked before about just-in-time learning, which is an idea that really comes out of industrial training, but it's that notion of if you teach me just what I need to learn, just when I need to learn it, I am so much more likely 
to in fact use it, do it well, remember it, and share it with others. So that, that there's the sweet spot. It's not a one-off text message. It's something that leads to, to real behavior change over time. Can we customize tips uh, based on the age of the child, based on the stage of the child's development, based on culture and language, and, and all the other ways in which families uh, are diverse? And, and um, you know, again, the technology allows us to not send just one message to everybody, but to send the right message to, to folks um, that really can support them. Can we send messages that are empowering? I, I said earlier, uh, one of the things that, that we've been scanning at the tech center at, at Ericsson is, is just the headline scan. And I'm doing a presentation for parents on Saturday. So in the last two weeks, that I, set the, I set the clock for two weeks to just look for headlines in the media around screen time. Well, there's always plenty. Um, but 90% of them are negative. 90% of them um, express fear or, or encourage parents to be afraid of what's going on instead of empowering them to make wise decisions. Uh, so we've got to watch out for those messages and we've got to combat some of that. Talked about nudges already and, and we're starting to see, again, I, I think of a nudge as a, a deeper dive into this notion of text messaging or just-in-time learning. Can we send parenting tips and digital skills? Can we, in fact, improve the way parents are using digital media as we use, get them to use digital media? Well, there's Comey Ansa in CASA, right? That one parent said she's never held an iPad before, and now she feels really confident and confident about using that iPad. I love the idea of let's use the tools to figure out how to use the tools. If parents have smartphones, then let's figure out how to get them using smartphones to connect with us and share ideas. And then I said earlier about access and equity um, and the digital use divide. And, and uh, the three of us, again, were at a symposium that the, the Department of Education held um, in the spring, and, and this, this kind of phrase, digital use divide, caught my attention because we, we've been saying digital divide for a long time, but what we're starting to see is that even when there are devices present in homes, they're being used very differently, or the child's access to it as a tool for learning is very different. Um, uh, in one home and another, and we've really got to pay attention to, to that as well. So what I've got on the screen now is just a, a handful of, of places. Um, you know, take a look, write, write some of these down, click your way through them. Uh, when the book comes out, take a look at, at longer descriptions that we've got about all of this. And, and Michael and Lisa, um, if, if you want to um, unmute after I talk about this and talk about the overlap between what you found and, and what we found, um, I, I'd be thrilled to have you do that. So Comiensa and Casa right off the bat um, is one that, that, that Michael just showed you and that, that um, all of us who are doing this work point to as an amazing example of mentoring that leads to power, parent empowerment. Ready Rosie, I mentioned before around video clips. Ready 4K is a, is a program um, out of uh, Stanford University or USC that, that's really trying to match messages um, around early learning and, and school readiness for parents, text for baby, um, uh, is coming out of zero to three and, and other places. Tech Goes Home is a great example of helping parents learn tech to use how to learn, learn tech. Uh, fantastic idea. Too Small to Fail is a, is a national effort that uses email and website and other social media ways to really um, get empowering and positive messages out. And then Vroom I mentioned before. Uh, Michael and Lisa, any comments here about about any of these, about what else you've seen? I would just say that there's a bunch of overlap here, and without spending too much time, that Atlas interactive map, we'll send the link out again, has uh, descriptions not only of what the program mix is in, in many of these instances, but also what's the underlying evaluation research that is stimulating the growth of the program. Um, you know, where is the pro where is the program gaining support from? Who's the population base and the setting and so on. So that is an organic, you know, evolving map and track that we're doing of these sorts of programs. And we would absolutely value uh, candidates, you know, from all of you that you think that we should be taking a closer look at. And, and, and I'll just add um, one of the things that I think the field still needs to do, I mean, it's a clear like, question on my mind. and and comes up as we talk about some of these examples that are surfacing as really interesting ones, is that it, it may become time to start categorizing and classifying a little bit and understanding what makes the most sense in which context. So for example, some of the 
the cases you see up here, say like Ready 4K or Text for Baby, which are using text messaging to reach parents, they are um, they're really outreach mechanisms, right? They're using technology in a way to 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 engage parents in new ways, so that those parents then um, feel you know empowered in that moment to oh yeah, there is this really cool activity I can do with my child, or yeah, we might have, let's have a let's have a fun gaming slash kind of playful conversation about this word. But that's different from. Uh, a, a media mentor program that may involve, say, librarians at a public library who are holding a story time to really model what it looks like to use an ebook with children in ways that doesn't completely um, vacate the adult's role, <laughs> um, and, and instead shows how parents can still play an integral role in talking with their kids, pointing at things that they're seeing in the book or on the screen, connecting them to what their experiences have been, walking to the library that morning or being at the bus stop. And that's about using media moments to enrich conversation um, in, a, in a way that's about joint media engagement, about using that media as a springboard um, for a conversation about that particular piece of content at that moment. So there's a lot of different I think there, we don't, haven't figured out all the parameters around this. I think the library community is going to be a huge um, leader on this and helping us understand what these kinds of roles are and which ones work best in which context. Great. Thanks, Michael Anderson. So I said yeah. earlier that I, I was going to show you, um, you know, a, a, an incomplete list of where I'm thinking of and finding media mentors. And so, yeah, just take a look at what's on the screen. You can see, you, you get the idea that, that um, I'm casting a, a bit broader net and that the co-authors and contributing authors in, in the book have, have done the same. That, that the notion, the rich idea of media mentorship um, can play out differently. I, I agree with Lisa. We need to, to look at context and, and what works and, and what makes sense. Um, but it also raises issues of, you know, what do all these media mentors need to know to be media mentors? And, and what are the messages that they can share? Uh, but, but that idea that, that uh, there are new allies to play with now, and, and again, that, that Michael and Lisa write about um, so wonderfully in, in the book, is, is just a reminder that there are a lot of folks who intersect around child development um, and early learning and working with parents and families. Um, and maybe we need to think about um, uh, taking advantage of some of those intersections. So I'm going to just leave you with a couple of, of quotes that, that I think are worth I'm not a big fan of reading on the screen, but I think sometimes you've got to hear words and not just see them. So let me share these. This one from Lisa. Today's young children who are using technology to learn and create while working with adults who can set good examples and guide them to new heights are receiving tremendous advantages. If only the privileged few have the opportunity for that kind of tech-assisted but human-powered learning, divides will only grow wider. Uh, a point that I made earlier, and this is um, from uh, an early um, essay that Lisa has contributed to this book as well. Our friends at Harvard Family Research Project said that digital media can be used not only to provide families with information, but also to increase their understanding to use that information effectively and creatively. By doing so, families take on the roles as lifelong educators and learners. They become powerful teachers for their own children who also gain new skills themselves. From the um, report that, that we started with um, uh, uh, earlier as well, media mentors actively engage with children and families interacting with digital media provided within the library context, both guiding children through positive and efficient uses of the technology and modeling for caregivers how they can support their children's digital literacy development outside of the library. Um, again, big ideas here. And then, um, I've been, I've been promoting Michael and Lisa's chapter, so I've got a quote of it as well. Now it is the time to both upgrade the skills of these professionals and envision new professional roles to help families understand and become savvy users of the digital media and interactive communication tools that are parts of children's nested environments. And so um, I'm giving those two the last word on my part of this uh, and uh, handing back to them. Lisa? 
Okay, great. Yeah, uh, th thank you so much, Chip. Uh, it's, 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 it's always it's kind of strange to see oh, your awesome. quote kind of right back to you. Um, thank you uh, very much for that. I, but one quick note before we go on to this next slide. The other thing I was thinking about when, and I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this when we talk about kind of categorizing and classifying and really understanding what these roles are. There's also the really important role of, of being a critical thinker about different media that's coming at kids and coming at parents, and not all of it's great, right? And librarians especially, but also um, uh, various uh, early childhood teachers have a pretty good sense of what's, uh, you know, what's, what's kind of schlocky and not so great for kids and or families, and what is actually really rich and beautiful to engage with. And so h helping You can parents, quote her on schlocky. <laughs> yeah. Like that's to make those that determinations. That's document. what's got to be on the slide next time, Chip. <laughs> yeah. It's not all great out there, right? So we need these media mentors to help us. And I'm saying this now as a parent who had to navigate this stuff and half the time really, uh, you know, fell into some holes um, to really help us make some good good choices. Um, so let me take a moment um, quickly here to show you a couple of things that we are making available on our tapclickread.org website. These are free and available to anybody who finds them useful. We're at the very beginning of launching these resources, um, and we're really eager for, for feedback. Um, so if you go to tapclickread.org, you see that, of course, we have those videos. You'll see a few of them in this screenshot here, um, and, and, and some more information about uh, events and, and uh, the app reviewers. But we also recently have created a space, I mentioned this earlier, where you can download tip sheets that can help you as an educator or as an early literacy specialist. Um, maybe take a moment to think a little bit more about what you want to focus on, perhaps talk about these issues with professional learning communities, um, perhaps bring, print them out and bring them to parent workshops. And we wanted to just show you what these are and, um, and, and where you can find them. So um, at topclickread.org, there's a Take Action button at the top or a, a tab. And once you go there, you get to this, uh, this uh, page that is where you can see the headline, Create Ecosystems of Early Learning and Literacy. That's really what we're trying to promote with, these, uh, with this media mentorship idea. And by clicking on the, red, the first red tab in your classroom and school, you get to a series of uh, one and two page documents that provide helpful tips and resources. If you click on the middle one, in your, in your home and with families, you get to a set of resources. And many of them are similar to what you might use in school settings, but there are some different ones as well. Um, I'll just point out a few of them that um, are noted here. We, we created a page that um, uses and kind of synthesizes research on how dual language learners um, may be able to really benefit from different media engagement moments. And so we have a tip sheet called How to Use Media to Support Children's Home Language. And the idea there is to, it's twofold. It's to promote the idea that the language that children speak at home are really important and it's okay that it's not English at first. In fact, that could be a really asset for children in the future um, in terms of their uh, growth as bilingual learners, but that parents may need encouragement to use their own language at home because they hear so many messages about English being the only thing that their children need, when in fact um, we're seeing that, their, that bilingualism or even trilingualism could be a, a huge asset to those children. So there's some ideas on this two-pager of how to help families with that. Um, we also have this page called How to Find Apps for Literacy Learning that on the front side uh, lists many of those app reviewers that we've talked about during this webinar. And on the back side shows some of those tips from Barbara Collada, who Michael mentioned earlier, and from um, librarians who have put together some rubrics that are incredibly valuable for doing a deeper evaluation of which apps uh, make sense for, for which learners. Um, and then the other tab that we have on this page is the In Your Community tab. Here right now we have two resources available. We're going to have many more in the coming uh, months. And they're really to help guide advocacy organizations, policy leaders, community activists, community organization directors, mayors, to start thinking about these ideas more holistically and recognize the connections between uh, literacy and kind of digital age equity. 
So we, we just wanted to, to point those out because we're hoping that they're part of maybe a suite of materials that today's media mentors, those who are starting to maybe see themselves in this role, that these materials can be the beginning of uh, a toolkit that various um, educators and media mentors can use. And lastly, I wanted to note that First Book has been a great partner with us on this. And if you go, if you know of First Book, as Michael described earlier, uh, an organization that's working with schools around the country um, and after school organizations to um, provide books, uh, very affordable, low cost um, books, and sometimes often free materials. We're working with them to disseminate our tips and resources and to build out their digital learning. Um, hub, which you can find at the First Book Marketplace. If you just put First Book Marketplace into Google, you'll you'll find that digital learning hub. So that is the the end of our our slide presentation. Um, we're eager to hear feedback and questions, and um, and I should before I um, turn it all the way over to our, our audience, just double check with Michael and Chip to make sure there's not something that I missed and that you all would want to to add in. I think that's great. We have 10 minutes. I just go through. Yeah. This is a great, great community. Thanks for hanging in there, you know, everybody. And I've been following um, not only the resources that people are kindly, you know, linking to when we discuss them, but a whole range of, you know, other things that people are working on. You know, Jessica, the work of Ready at Five is a wonderful, you know, recent example yeah. of linkages, and folks are actually involved in their own apps development and people you know talking about um, you know wanting to get more information and you know more of a community going here and that's exactly our intention is to um, work with you and actually feature the very important work that you know you guys are, are doing I want to say before the questions and I'll end with the moderator that if anybody wants to send me an email about work, it's just michael.levine at sesame.org. And I'm glad to communicate you know, via um, email with any one of you if we can be helpful over here. So I'll turn it back to um, our wonderful moderator. Thank you so much. We've had so much chat in um, the background, and we've been trying to share that out with everyone. And very quickly, I just want to reassure everyone before we get to maybe one or two questions, all of the resources that Chip, Lisa, and Michael have shared will be given to you um, in the follow-up email. And um, we're going to try to collect some of those other resources that participants and other learners have been so kind to share with us today and include that in the list of resources. Thank you so much. Um, Chip, uh, I think this is a question for you about um, your book, um, if the book is going to be available in Spanish. Good question. That's one I need to ask the publisher. I don't know of um, immediate plans for that to be the case, which is very um, unfortunate. <laughs> Thank now, you. I will, I will say that if there are chapters in the book, Chip, that you think would be particularly of interest to professionals who work with um, Latino, you know, Hispanic families, we have sure. resources here where we could help you, you know, with that. Thank and, you. Now, I also see Karen Suarez asked a very excellent mm -hmm. question, Chip, which I think you might want to you know, begin to think about and perhaps we're already doing some work on, which is if an organization wants to promote or be media mentors, what's the best route for training and resources? I think that's the sort of stuff that we need to make up. Right, exactly. Um, uh, you know, the, it's, it's back to that fundamental conversation we all had about digital media literacy and what do you need to know. Um, I think we're all um, raising the bar here. We're, we're expecting um, a lot from media mentors, and there are barriers to achieving that along the way. In, in my part of the world, um, teacher preparation and those who prepare teachers uh, are going to have to um, really embrace this idea as well. But, you know, I see media mentorship not just about knowledge and skills, but really about uh, a desire to, to interact and build relationships around uh, ways that media can can support young children. And Chip, if I could uh, jump in there on, on that question too, I uh, the question of 
how one kind of trains to become a media mentor. I think we may be at a phase now where we need to engage in a serious way with um, various uh, organizations that work with faculty members at iSchools and library schools uh, yep. around, the, around the country to understand better what the, the coursework is at present for those who are working in in uh, early literacy children's librarians and early childhood programs, um, and then to make sure that we're um, helping to provide resources that they may not feel like they can put their fingers on right now. I think uh, even, more, even more importantly, in a certain respect, Lisa, is to work with those who could provide in-service training and support through the professional sure. association exactly. and, yes, that too. and through and, and 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 pre organizations, organizations like CHIPS who um, you know, reach educators of many different stripes. So we're going to need to figure out some ways to do this kind of hard work that Karen is asking yep. about to define what is a knowledge base that actually should be, you know, every, every media mentor, you know, needs to know and be able to do and, and, and be able to practice. Daryl is also asking something very much related to this, which is, you know, very, very busy librarians, this is Daryl Robertson's question. What would a busy public librarian, you know, do each week to be a better, you know, media mentor? What are three things that they should do each week? Boy, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, a, that's great a good question. question, right? I mean, I just think about myself, like, how do I keep up? And it's, and it's hard. <laughs> um, I, I do think that there's some, some um, journalistic resources out there that are helpful. The digital, uh, so on EdWeek, there's the Digital Directions blog. Um, which I, I find is a nice way to kind of tap into what's going on. Um, I, I'm going to do a call out to Michael's blog uh, at the John Gans Cooney Center. The Cooney Center often um, will run really interesting articles about uh, connections between all sorts of deeper learning that children need and where technology fits with it. Um, and there have been this has been reference to blogs like uh, Little Elit and others where various uh, and groups like that where various um, librarians are, are connected to each other. Um, in, the early, in the early childhood space, uh, Chip, I really think it's through your, your center uh, in, in a lot of people following what, what you're doing and where you're speaking <laughs> that a lot of those sure. connections are made. But I'm probably also you know, missing several different Well, you know, Daryl asked about some specifics. Um, one of the things that we've been having great success with um, inside of a, a school or a center where there's a group of teachers is really encouraging them to create an app play group, a tech play group. Um, and there's two ways to do this. One is that everybody in the group plays with the same app for a week or two and then we come back and talk about it. The other way is that we all pick a different app and we come back and talk about it. But that, that idea that we've got to have some play time. I'm, I'm not sure how we get, um, how we really use technology as a playful tool for learning if the adults um, aren't playful with technology. Uh, so so I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. So, so some play time on your own and then some sharing with other teachers I think is a way to really you know, start the process. And then you know, we've got resources at the Tech Center and as the New American and CUNY Center. So we'll, you know, we'll try to connect you to some things that are going on. I would say um, just off the top of my head, I'd take um, two of the things that were just discussed and add a, a third one. I would spend some time between a half an hour and an hour every week just reading, looking at the blogs, looking at literature. Um, I would definitely try to play with the kids and the families a bit. You know, so the playtime that Chip just described. And I would spend you know, an hour asking questions, if I could, of the kids and of the um, parents who are in the library. There's some very, very interesting research from Susan Newman, which many of you know about, in which she looks at the, difference, the different kinds of experiences that children of privilege and children of lesser means receive when they're you know, sitting in community libraries and you know she she just finds that there's just different kinds of experiences that kids have not not related to the librarians themselves per se but just because of the knowledge and the mentoring that they have sort of coming into the library so having conversations with the parents and especially with the kids who are in your libraries will make you a better media mentor great advice thank you 
Yes, um, there is so much discussion and a really uh, robust I – mean, the chats are still coming in. I, I, we are at the top of the hour, and I want to be aware of everyone's time constraints. Um, there are a couple things I do need to do to close out the webinar before people jump off and get back to their, to their busy lives working with or um, <laughs> young children. Um, please do, if you have a moment, as I thank our presenters, um, this has been an amazing conversation. Um, we're trying to chat out as much as we can on the back end to all of you. But don't worry if you have to jump off because we will share all of the resources that Michael, Lisa, and Chip and all of your peers on this webinar shared, we'll make sure to get you a really good resource document um, as a follow-up. We do want to know though, um, one thing you learned today, um, TechSoup here in partnership with the Early Learning Lab, it's very important that we know what you find useful and what you learn during our educational events such as this webinar. Um, or it could be something that you are really super excited about and you want to share with your colleagues um, or within your professional network. Um, let us know what that is. Um, another thing is you, you will see a pop-up survey at the end of this webinar, or if you're closing out right now, there will be a pop-up uh, pop survey. I do want to ask on behalf of the Early Learning Lab, Chip, Lisa, and Michael, and me, for you to complete that survey, there are specific questions we ask, and also if you would like to connect with the Early Learning Lab after this webinar so that we can follow up with you and send you information. Um, TechSoup is uh, a nonprofit organization that serves nonprofits and libraries. So if you don't know about TechSoup, you should definitely check us out, www.techsoup.org. Um, you can also find, about, find out about some of our donated products um, such as Microsoft. We also have Reading Eggs, which is um, mm -hmm. it's an early, yeah, it's an early literacy program. Um, seriously, this has been one of the most engaging back-end chats that we've had. Um, it's been amazing. I'm really appreciative of everyone responding to and, and sharing their resources. Um, Chip, Lisa, and Michael, thank you so much for taking your valuable time to put this presentation together as well as sharing all of your resources. I've, I've learned a lot um, even having been in the early literacy field, so thank you so much. And Chatal, I don't know if you wanted to say anything, but um, you have you know, connected um, these resources with our audience. Thank you so much. And thanks to Early Learning Lab. Thank you, Susan. And all I would like to say is fabulous presentation and so much participation from the audience. These questions are amazing. All the resources shared um, with gratitude. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Yes, care. as we close out, thank you. Um, I also want to extend a sincere thank you to Becky who has been on our back end. She has been hey, fast as fingers. Yeah. Yay! She has been chatting everything out as fast as she could. Um, join us um, on June 30th. We are going to have an Outlook um, webinar. It is free. Um, and you can come to that whether you are a member of TechSoup or not. Um, we also want to thank ReadyTalk who provides this platform for TechSoup to be able to deliver these webinars. And to all of you that have stayed through this for the 90, actually 95 minutes now, thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you, and we appreciate your time. Have Take a wonderful care, rest of your week. Take care.